What is a tree? Ask a botanist and they'll probably say something like a perennial plant with an elongated stem or trunk that supports branches and leaves. Ask a computer scientist and they might give you an answer that, oddly, sounds kind of similar. Ask a descriptive set theorist though and they might say, yeah, of course that's what they'd say. In fact, if you asked 100 mathematicians what a tree is, you'd probably get 100 different definitions, and somehow they'd all be correct. Why? The concept of a tree is just so incredibly versatile. Across disciplines, trees are used to represent complexity in a way that still feels natural, whether you're modeling a sentence, a strategy, or an infinite sequence of numbers. In this video, we'll start by going over some practical applications of trees, then we'll build on this intuition until we're finally ready to tackle the set theorist definition. By the end, I hope you'll see that despite all their differences, these trees are really just different branches of the same fundamental idea. Before we dig into particular examples of trees and their applications, we'll first establish some basic terminology. Formally, a tree is a connected, acyclic graph where any two nodes are connected by exactly one path. Connected means we can always find a path connecting any two nodes. Acyclic means there is never a path from one node back to itself, assuming you ignore the case where we simply traverse the same edge back to a node. Generally, when we think of a tree, we think of a directed tree a tree where each edge has a start and an end. In particular, we normally think of a directed rooted tree, a directed tree where there is some designated start node. For a directed tree, a parent node is a node that is connected to the start of an edge. Similarly, a child node is a node that is connected to the end of an edge. With this terminology, we can say that the root of a tree is the unique node which has no parent. Finally, a leaf node is a node with no children. With the basic terminology out of the way, hopefully the inspiration behind naming trees, trees, feels a bit more intuitive. Now that we know the abstract definition of a tree, we can dig into some more applied examples. Even if you've never studied computer science, you've probably already used a tree without realizing it. Just open your file explorer. At the top, you have your drive, the C drive on Windows, or maybe Macintosh HD on Mac. That's your root. From there, everything branches out. You've got folders, which contain other folders, which contain even more folders. And somewhere at the end of each branch, you'll find an actual file. Your document, your video, your extremely insecure spreadsheet containing all of your passwords. In computer science terms, each folder is an internal node in a tree, and each file is a leaf, a final endpoint with no children. Assuming you're better organized than me and don't leave a bunch of empty folders hanging around. This tree structure is what makes navigating a file system so efficient, you don't scroll through one giant list of everything. Instead, you drill down layer by layer, following a path through the tree until you find exactly what you're looking for. So even before we get to things like binary search trees or recursion, you're already familiar with one of the most fundamental data structures in computer science, just by browsing your desktop. Another tree you likely interact with without realizing is the one behind the website you're watching this on right now. When you visit a website, your browser sends a request to the server asking, what should I show the user? The server responds with a file, usually written in HTML or hypertext markup language. This file tells the browser how to structure the content of the page. But your browser doesn't just read the file line by line like a script. Instead, it builds something called the Document Object Model or DOM a tree-like structure that turns the raw HTML into a dynamic, interactive representation of the page. Each node in the DOM tree represents an element, a paragraph, a button, an image, or even a container that holds other elements. This tree structure makes it easy for your browser to access, update, and rearrange different parts of the page, especially as you interact with it. Let's take a simple example. A typical DOM tree starts with a single root node, usually the HTML element, which wraps the entire page. Inside that, we might have high-level containers like the head for metadata and the body for visible content. For a simple static web page, the DOM tree will be simple, but for something like YouTube, the tree can become enormous and constantly changing. In this case, we have to break things down even further. The body might contain a header section, a navigation bar, a main content area, and a sidebar. And each of these sections contain even more nested elements like logos, search bars, icons, and text. This is a simplified version. In reality, every recommended video, every comment, every menu toggle, 
all of these are nodes being added and removed or modified in real time. To give you an idea of how deep this rabbit hole goes, I inspected the DOM tree for one of my other videos, and the deepest visible element on screen lives inside 39 nested containers. That's 39 layers deep before you even reach the actual content. While researching this video, I found an article from 15 years ago by designer Randy Crum, where he shared visualizations of DOM trees from popular websites using a tool created by Marcel Salath. Even back then, these trees were astonishingly complex, and today's web pages have grown far beyond that. Sadly, the original visualization tool no longer works, but these images still serve as a powerful reminder of how even the websites we take for granted are supported by deep, intricate tree-like structures beneath the surface. One of the most common trees you'll run into on a technical interview or your first data structures class is the binary tree. Now, depending on who you ask or which textbooks you open, you might find slightly different definitions, but for our purposes, a binary tree is a rooted, directed tree where each node has at most two children, a left child and a right child. Or, if you prefer the colorful parlance of early computer scientists, a binary tree is a bifurcating arborescence. At first glance, this may not seem all that special. Why limit yourself to just two children per node? Why not three or four? But the real power of binary trees isn't just in their shape, it's how we use that shape to impose structure. This brings us to one of the most important variants, the binary search tree, or BST. A binary search tree is just a binary tree with one crucial rule. For any node, the left subtree is a binary search tree that values less than the node's value, and the right subtree is a binary search tree that values greater than the node's value. As is generally true with recursive definitions, this doesn't seem very intuitive. So let's look at an example. Say we're getting a list of random numbers that we want to store. Now, normally we would just throw these into an array and be done. But we know that this list is prone to changing pretty often with new values being added and old values being removed at random. We also want to query this list often to see if a particular value is actually in it. This can be slow with a regular list, especially since our array is unsorted. So we decided to build a binary search tree instead. To start, we take our first value to be the root node. Now we look at our next element. Since three is smaller than our root node, we'll place it to the left side and add a connection. Let's take one more element. Since 6 is less than our root node, we know it has to go somewhere on the left side of our tree. Now, since 6 is greater than 3, we know it needs to go to the right of 3. So we will place it there and add a connection from 3 to 6. Once more, we grab an element. This time, it's greater than our root node, so we'll place it to the right of the root and add a connection. We can keep doing this, building up our tree in this way until all of our numbers have been added. So, why is this useful? Say someone asked us if a particular number was in our list. If we had just stored our data in an array, we'd have to check every single value in the array to see if it matched our target number. Even if it was in our list, we'd still have to check on average half of the values. As our array gets longer and longer, it takes longer to check if a particular value is in the array. In fact, since we need to check every number in our array, it takes n many operations. So searching for a number in an unsorted array has O of n time complexity. With a binary search tree, on the other hand, we only need two checks. First, checking that 9 is greater than our root node tells us that we need to go down the right side of our tree. Then, checking that 9 is less than 10 tells us we need to go down the left side from there. But since the 10 node has no left child, 9 can't be in our list. In fact, we will only ever have to make at most as many checks as the height of our tree. So when we build our tree well, this means we'll only need log of n many checks on average to tell if a number is in the list, giving searching in a BST a time complexity of only O of log n. If you were paying close attention, you may have noticed I glossed over a pretty important caveat there. What does it mean to build a tree well? In our example, we were pretty lucky with the order of our initial array. Our tree looks pretty evenly distributed, with the same number of nodes on the left as on the right at every stage. But what if we were really unlucky and happened to receive an already sorted array? As we can see, this ends up giving us one long branch with no splits. The issue with this tree is that it is not balanced. That is, most nodes don't split into both left and right children. The more balanced a binary search tree is, the more efficient it is to perform operations on it. This shows our naive method of building a binary search tree may not be robust enough. Thankfully, there are a number of alternative construction methods that guarantee a balanced tree, but those are a bit beyond the scope of this video. So while a binary tree might look like just another way to organize things, its structure can make all the difference. And that idea, that structure shapes power, is something we'll keep seeing as we explore trees in other scopes too.
the next data structure I want to talk about is a tree. A tri? A tree? Tree. Well, that's confusing. I'm going to go with calling it a try. Thus far, each of the trees we've considered use nodes to store some value we're interested in, without much concern for the actual path taken to reach that node. A try is a little different in that the value at each node is determined by the path taken to reach it. For example, say we want to store this list of six words. We could just store them in an array, but that seems a little wasteful considering so many of them start with the same letter, especially as the number of words we're storing grows into the thousands or millions. Instead, we can use a try to store our values. To do this, we start by looking at the first letter of every word and adding a node for each unique letter. Next, we'll look at the first two letters of every word and add a node for the second letter as a child of the corresponding first letter's node. Finally, we do this again for our third letter, giving us our final try. To access the elements stored in this try, we just need to traverse through the branches until you find the leaf node. For example, you can start by passing through T and writing it down. Then we pass through E, write that down. And finally, we pass through A, which is the leaf node, so we know the word T is in our tree. This can be hard to visualize with the standard structure, but we can tweak the structure a bit to make it easier to follow by placing the letters on the branches and placing the values we've seen so far in the actual nodes. While the actual structure of a try resembles the left representation, this representation makes it much easier to see how they actually work. Tries shine when you're dealing with prefix-based lookups. Want to find every word that starts with TE? Just follow the T branch to the E branch and collect everything underneath. That's why they're often used in autocomplete systems like Google Search Autocomplete. If you've ever watched Wire's Blank Answers the Web's Most Searched Questions videos, these wouldn't be possible without tries. Want to see a really cool application of tries? I recommend checking out Code Parade's video on word squares. He uses tries to generate increasingly complex combinations of words that fit together perfectly in an n by n square. This was actually my first introduction to the tri data structure, and it was massively helpful in aiding my understanding of set theoretic trees. Now that we've built some intuition behind trees, I think we're finally ready to tackle the set theoretic definition of a tree. Let's recall the definition from earlier. Okay, this is a little intimidating, so let's take it one part at a time. The notation x to the less than omega means the set of all finite sequences of elements from x. For example, if x is the English alphabet, then x to the less than omega includes every possible finite string of letters, real words like tree or math, and nonsense words like zertplop. To keep things simple, let's say x is just the set containing 0 and 1. Then x to the less than omega is the set of all finite binary strings 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, so on. Now we ask, what does it mean for a set of these sequences to form a tree? Let's pick a sequence S at NT, say a 10-bit string. This definition tells us that if this string is in our tree, then every shortened prefix of it must also be in the tree. That means the 9-bit prefix, the 8-bit prefix, and so on and so forth must be included. This gives us a very specific kind of structure. Every sequence must be built up step by step from the root. No element can appear out of nowhere, it has to grow from smaller pieces, because of that, we can represent the whole set as a tree. Each node represents a string, and each string is a path built from the root by choosing 0 or 1 at each step. Sound familiar? That's because this is essentially the exact same structure as a try. In both cases, each level of the tree represents a position in a sequence, and each branch represents a possible value at that position. The difference is that tries were built with practicality in mind how to store data efficiently, how to minimize redundancy, etc., etc. Set theoretic trees don't care about that. We're not bound by memory limits or runtime efficiency, and that opens the door to something remarkable. In computer science, our trees are always finite. Maybe huge, but still bounded. But in set theory, there's no reason to stop. A tree can go on forever. We can talk about trees with infinitely many levels, infinitely many branches, even trees where every possible infinite binary sequence is represented as a path. Of course, what you're seeing on screen is just a finite approximation of an infinitely complex object. But the rules are the same. Each path is built one step at a time. Each node grows from its predecessors. And that's the real magic of trees. Whether you're building autocomplete systems or studying the foundations of mathematics, we keep coming back to the same idea. A tree is a way to grow complex structures with simple rules, one branch at a time. We've seen trees show up pretty much everywhere. Your file system, your browser, your autocomplete bar, and now even in the strange, infinite world of set theory. And despite how different these worlds are, the basic idea behind a tree hasn't changed. Start with something simple and build by branching out one step at a time. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you had as much fun exploring trees as I did putting this video together. And a big shout out to Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown for organizing the 2025 Summer of Math Exposition. There are a lot of fantastic entries this year, so definitely check out some of the other videos if you haven't already. If you'd like to see more content like this, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, I've just launched a Patreon. No bonus content yet, but more is on the way soon. That's it for now. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.